There's an imaginary line out there between right and wrong, good and evil. I believe what I am doing is good, and what I'm standing up against is evil. Somos los cocineros de metafetamina. Claro que hacemos daño, eh. Lo sabemos. It's the cartels. They're the ones terrorizing their own country, and now they're starting to do it over here. ¿Qué harías tú? Esperar que vinieran por ti o que defenderte. The cartel scouts keep getting away. El gobierno no proporciona las garantías de seguridad que el pueblo necesita. Nos podemos armar. Si ustedes le pasara lo que nos pasó a nosotros, estuvieran con nosotros. They're taking back what is theirs from the cartel. This way it should be done up here too. Nobody touches me. Drop them. You savvy? una ley que se llama ojo por ojo y diente por diente. Fíjense para atrás. ¿O no nos vamos a convertir en los criminales que andamos combatiendo? ¿Con quién trabajas? the lucky ones for now. Ustedes lo están viendo es porque yo ya dejé de existir. Thanks everybody. Hello. Uh, let's get right into it. Um, I, I don't know if you could tell by the trailer, but this is a pretty intense movie. Uh, it's embedded, to say the least. And you were embedded. You were shooting. You shot. You directed. You produced. I think you probably do some editing as, as well. But let's talk about shooting it. Let's talk about what brought you to Mexico. What gave you the idea? What gave you the access? How it all started? So I first uh, read an article, I heard about these vigilantes in Arizona, and originally the film was about that side of the border. Um, I filmed there for about four or five months, and then my father actually sent me an article about the auto defenses, these citizens who rose up to fight against the, the Knights Templar cartel in uh, the state of Michoacan in Mexico. And right when I read it, I knew I wanted to create this parallel story of these two different vigilante groups fighting the same common enemy, the Mexican drug cartels. Do you really feel like they're fighting a, a common enemy? I mean, there's an element when you're watching the film where the auto defenses, am I saying that correctly? The auto defenses in, in Mexico, they feel like they're fighting an enemy. This feels like the Wild West. And when these guys of Arizona Recon say that it feels like the Wild West for them, it feels like they want it to feel like the Wild West more than it might actually be that. So, you know, at the heart, as you saw in the trailer, at the heart of this film are, these, are the leaders of these two groups, Tim Naylor Foley on the Arizona side, and El Doctor on the uh, Mexican side. They're both 55 years old. They both believe that the government has failed them. And they both have taken the law into their own hands to fight for what they believe in. But the circumstances are quite different. In Mexico, the violence is real. It's visceral. Uh, 80,000 people killed since 2007. 20,000 plus people disappeared since 2007. Uh, whereas in Arizona, that, that violence is a little bit more theoretical. It's a fear that the Mexican drug wars will seep its way across our border. I mean, is that fear founded, do you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's easy to sort of talk about the border from the, you know, halls of New York, but I think once you get down there, you realize that, you know, you do feel like you're in a bit of a lawless area, um, an area that, you know, is controlled by the cartels. Um, even though we're on U.S. soil, you look about, up on the mountaintops and there are cartel scouts watching you. Um, you can listen on the radio and you can hear uh, them talking about you. 
you can hear them, you know, shepherding drugs and people through the valley, you know, where we were filming. Um, you know, even if you talk to U.S. Border Patrol, you, you know, they feel like they're undermanned, understaffed, underfunded, and, um, you know, that they're fighting this sort of David and Goliath battle against the cartel. So when you're in uh, Mexico, I can't pronounce the name of the town, excuse me, or the, the, is it a state or is it's it? A, it's a state it's of a Michoacan. State. It's Michoacan, hard, hard, hard to you. pronounce. Uh, and you're working with El Doctor and Auto Defensas. How did you gain that access? How did you make them want to tell their story to you? I, I heard about the story. I, I contacted this journalist uh, who, had, who had filmed, uh, excuse me, had written a story about the doctor. And uh, that night I got on the phone with him and I said to him, look, you know, I want to come down here, come down to Mexico and, and document this story, document, you know, this historical moment in, in Mexican history. Um, and he said, yeah, come on down. And two weeks later, I was down there filming. So a, he was kind of your gateway. He could introduce my, you to these people that he had interviewed, and he, he could was my kind gateway. of vouch for you a little bit? Yeah, in the film, it's, it's not a talking head film. It's not a film with experts. It's not a film with outside voices. It's an experiential film in which I was embedded with these groups for uh, you know, almost a year. And the story, when I went on this basically this crazy adventure that I never, ever could have imagined. Um, I'm not a war reporter. I've never been in situations like that before. Uh, but you know, through the process of making this film, I you know, found myself in, in shootouts between the vigilantes and the cartel, uh, you know, meth labs, torture chambers, um, you know, places I never could have imagined. And especially when I first stepped foot in Mexico, I thought I was telling this you know, very simple story of guys in white shirts fighting against guys in black shirts, you know, a classic sort of Western tale of, of good versus evil. And slowly over time, I realized that the lines between good and evil were, were much more blurred. And that's what fascinated me. That's what sort of, I became obsessed with trying to understand what was really happening. Obsessed with trying to understand what was really happening or what was right, what was wrong, if there was even, if even that existed at all. All, all of the above. Right. Because you end up seeing that the, the, the auto defenses, as much as they are trying to fight for the people and they are trying to take, they are trying to give law back to, to the citizens, Absolute power corrupts for some of them, and you get to see a certain amount of them when they bring uh, people that they've arrested to the torture chamber, I guess you could call it, the torture chamber. The, a couple people seem pretty delighted that they have this certain power over them. I mean, I think part of this story is um, what happens when government institutions fail? What happens when people live in a lawless society? Um, what happens when you, you, know, you have no one to turn to? Uh, or the very institutions that are there to protect you either aren't there or in collusion or corruption uh, with the cartels. Um, that's a scary world to live in. You know, we talked to you know, a young woman whose whole family was murdered by the cartel and she, she couldn't tell anyone about it. She couldn't go to the police. She was fearful that the police were either would rat her out to the cartel or, or were the cartel. Um, that's a really scary world to live in. And that's, that's the terror that many, you know, people in Mexico liveth. It's partially what happens when uh, the majority of your economy is wrapped up in a black market economy and an economy that the government itself can't support or get behind or uh, institutionalize in, in, in any way. Completely. Yeah. And, you know, that's where this movement was born out of. It was a, it was a desire to sort of bring uh, safety and stability to, uh, you know, their towns. And, you know, this is in some ways a you know, very timely film, but somewhat of a timeless film too. I mean, we've seen armed groups throughout history rise up um, to fight against evil, to protect themselves. Um, we see it playing out throughout the world today, and we'll continue to see it play out throughout our future. So you're not a war reporter, as you said. You, you, you never had any experience as an embedded journalist, if you will. How did you get used to it? And at the same time, when, when did you realize that this story was best told from a sort of verite uh, mindset? Because to be honest, you could have told it for yourself in a much easier if you just had talking head experts and a little bit of footage, or you could have told, not the same story, obviously, excuse me. <laughs> but you know, you, you could have addressed or gone after it in a way that wouldn't have involved you being embedded and being, and being shot at. Look, there's been many people, you know, much smarter than me who have written books about the drug wars, who have, you know, told stories about the drug wars. You know, a lot of, you know, this has been glorified in TV shows and movies. 
I really wanted to sort of take this issue away from the headlines and put myself on the ground, right in the middle of the action, uh, and, and let this story tell itself. Um, you know, I, I really ended up with a story that was much, much different than when I started. Um, I mean, I mean it as a compliment. To, to decide to do verite means to step in and be there and be even more committed, right? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, every single day, on a normal documentary shoot, you sort of wake up, you have like a call sheet, you have a, you know, call time, you have a lunch break, you have a wrap time. Let's set up our three, uh, three light camera interview, Sure, like sit down. this, we had, you know, every single day was an adventure. Um, every single day was often terrifying. Um, what kind of effect did that have on you? Did you find that that had any personal effect on you, or did you have enough distance with holding a camera? I think for me, you know, despite all the sort of action moments that you see in the trailer and that, you know, you see in the film if you, if you go see it, um, for me, the most affecting moment uh, was this interview that I did with a young woman who was kidnapped by the cartel uh, alongside her husband. And she witnessed him being chopped up to pieces and then burned to death. And to be in this room with this woman and to look at her and to see this sort of body that was there, but then look into her eyes and they were like deeply hollow, um, almost as if like her whole soul had been sucked out of her. Um, you capture that too, not to interrupt, but you definitely, yeah, I remember is, that scene from the film, the film and film. that is that... That feeling of, of her eyes is definitely captured in how, how long you hold the camera while she's not talking. Yeah, and, and then to think, for me, to think about how are the same species of human beings that would do that to other people, that stuck with me mentally much more so than any of the like, action scenes in the film. Well, it's one thing for us to keep uh, talking about the action scenes of the film, but it's another thing to show it. Maybe we should show a clip that you, uh, that you brought with you that shows a kind of a a day in the life of these vigilantes sort of arresting people and, and looking for folks who may be involved with the cartels. Let's take a look at that clip. It's unbelievable that you even thought to change your f-stop in that moment. That you're like, oh, it's a little too bright. Let me let me bring this down. I would have been ducking for cover the whole time. Uh, was that your first experience getting shot at while shooting the film, or was that hey, were you a uh, uh, you know old hand at it at that point? That was that was near the end of the film. Um, so I'd been in a few situations um, like that before. For me, I mean, it never stopped being terrifying. Obviously, I think if it did, I would be either crazy or inhuman. Um, but actually being behind the camera and focusing on the craft of filmmaking, focusing on changing my f-stop, changing on, focusing on you know, making sure the record button is on, uh, just the sort of process of filmmaking, I think calmed me down a little bit in those tense situations. I, you know, I've, I've shot stuff before and I've accidentally not hit record. I can't imagine walking away from a gunfight and being like, I forgot to hit record. <laughs> the biggest nightmare of my life. Well, there's actually something wrong. In the first shootout in the film, there's something wrong with the card. And I went, when I went back I, and I looked at the footage and it wasn't playing and I almost lost it, but ended up being fine. You were able to recover the footage? It was, it was totally fine, yeah. Oh my God, I would have... <laughs> my first shootout. Didn't get it. Um... <laughs> Uh, so, so, you know, talk about doing, do, doing these shootouts. You know, these guys, as we see them, like anybody in the midst of a war, there's a certain amount of adrenaline and there's a certain amount of excitement. And when you're watching it, you know, as, as, as a viewer, 
you sort of shake with, with, with a bit of fear and apprehension about who they are because you see that excitement and that exhilaration in their eyes. But then you remember that it's, it, it, it is war and they are fighting. Yeah, I mean, it's also important to recognize that these are not soldiers, uh, especially on the, on the auto-defensive side, on the Mexican side. These are everyday people. You know, our main character was a doctor, a small-town doctor. Uh, you know, these are farmers, storekeepers, lawyers that are out there fighting. You know, this is a citizen movement that, that rose up to fight against the cartel. Um, so similar to your, your militia in Arizona, I don't think they like to be called a militia, right? But they, they are an armed militia, you know, for lack of a better word. They, you know, they're a border security group is what they call themselves. Right. They are citizens that got armed to protect themselves and to protect other civilians. But also, is it fair to say maybe because they were looking for a certain amount of adrenaline, a certain amount of action? I think, you know, I think they feel that they, um, that are, you know, in their eyes, in their minds, uh, the government is failing to protect our borders, and so they've taken it upon themselves to do so. But when we see the auto defenses, I mean, we just see, when we see the excitement that a number of them have for uh, a certain amount of the, the, these shootouts. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's really hard to judge these situations until you're there. Um, you know, so many of these auto defenses especially had family members that are murdered, family members that are killed. Um, you know, that's part of what the story is about too, is, is what motivates men and women to take up arms. And everyone, you know, every single person had their own reasons for, to do what they're doing. Um, some for revenge, some for power, um, some to perhaps take over the businesses that they were uh, expelling from, from the state. That's, you know, obviously, this, we don't want to give away the end of the movie, but part of what happens in the movie is, is those fighting against evil start to exhibit signs of evil. And so... Well, again, it's an economy. I mean, it's a black market economy. It runs a large part of the country, and you can only run for so long fighting against the, the major way to make a living in, that, in, the, in the country. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what happened um, is that the auto defenses successfully were beating back the cartel. They were taking over towns by towns and, um, you know, essentially creating this power vacuum. And within that power vacuum, somebody needed to fill it. And that's part of the tension in the, in the third act of the film. Well, let's talk about the first scene of the film. Uh, which we haven't discussed yet, which is you with uh, a group of meth cooks um, who, and I complimented you on this before, I love that they sort of call you out as a filmmaker and those behind the camera and say, in many ways, it's a privilege that you get to film this. This is the life that we have to lead. What did that make you feel like when, when they said that to you while you were filming? Outside of, got it. <laughs> I mean, meth was a really important part of the story. Um, Meth was the lifeblood of the cartel. It was their uh, cash cow, you know? And most of the meth that we consume in the US comes from Mexico, a lot of it from the Knights Templar cartel. So from the minute I stepped foot in Mexico, I wanted to be, I wanted to try to get into a meth lab. And every single shoot, I'd ask somebody, do you know somebody, know somebody, know somebody? And nothing, you know? Kept sort of getting false leads, you know, getting teased. And then it was finally on our last shoot um, that we got a call saying, you know, be in this town square at 6 p.m. and you're in. And we went to the town square and a group of masked men drove us into a field. Um, How scared were you? Pretty scared. Um, and then another, they said that they're going to provide protection. And then another car drove up and drove us into this lab. And I dreamed of shooting this scene for like months. Um, I've actually never seen Breaking Bad, but um, I sort of envisioned and imagined this like halogen lit trailer. And when we get there, it's, we're in the middle of this forest in the middle of uh, you know, this very rural area of Michoacan, and it's pitch black. And I don't shoot with lights. So if, if it's pitch black and you don't have lights, it's a bit of a problem. So I was like, I came all the way here, I waited nine months to get in here, and I have nothing to film because I can't see anything. And then the, the head chef starts showing me around the lab uh, with this little flashlight. And it's with that flashlight that we sort of, that I lit that first, that I lit that scene. 
And, and just the with the flashlight? Just with the little flashlight. And that scene you know, ended up being, you know, as you said, where we start the film and where we end the film. And in the end, it's a very important reveal uh, that, that closes the movie. So it ended up being a really integral part of the film. Um, but those guys, you know, at first, in, in that first opening scene, as, as they're talking to me, they, they're farmers. They, they look at themselves as farmers. They're cultivating a crop. It just so happens that that crop is meth. It just so happens that that crop makes its way northward and, and ruins a lot of people's lives. But for them, they're just getting by. And that's when they called me out and said, look, you know, we'd love to travel the world like you. We'd love to make documentaries about people like us, but... Yeah. Yeah. What did that make you feel like, though, when, when, when they said that to you or when you're editing that and when you think about that, when you think about the privilege that you have as a documentary filmmaker, the privilege that I have to sit up here and have this conversation, you know, with you? Look, you know, we're, we're all... And it's not, excuse me, it's not a negative privilege. You are telling a, in a very important story and you're using that privilege for good. I feel very lucky to do what I do. Um, it is a privilege. It's a privilege uh, to have people open their lives up to me. It's a privilege... Uh, to be able to travel to places like this and tell stories, you know, I feel very lucky. And, you know, I feel very fortunate that I was able in this film to find characters uh, that were willing to open their lives up to me uh, and let me go on this journey with them. Um, and I, I really wanted to not create sort of a, as I said, a talking head film or a impersonal film. You know, with this film, I, I got access to places that I never could have imagined getting access to, both literally and, and personally within, within the lives of our characters. You know, I never ask anybody this question because I think it's kind of a hacky interview question to ask what's next, but what the hell could you possibly do next after this? Like, I, I don't know how you could even want to make another... <laughs> I'd be like, I'm done, I did it, I got it. Shut me down. <laughs> uh, go meditate for a while. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I love, you know... I don't know. The, the answer is I don't know. I have a few projects that I'm, I'm working on um, that, I'm really, that I'm excited about, um, and we'll see, we'll see what's next. I mean, it's, have it's, you become a, like a documentary adrenaline junkie now, where like, you know, you're, the next project you're looking for is another getting in, embedded again? I, you know, I love my girlfriend. I love my family. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's, to be honest, I mean, the film took a lot out of me, and so I don't know if I want to do it again. Um, we'll see. Let's, uh, let's take some questions. Who do we have uh, questions from here in this audience? Hi, the amount of coverage you got is just riveting. I'm still I'm really looking forward to seeing this film. You know, you mentioned Breaking Bad. Um, were the people that you were embedded with, were they aware that the show even existed? And how would they compare what was you know, depicted on the show versus what they're living in their everyday lives? Uh, they did. The meth cookers were aware of making Breaking Bad. Um, they thought that it was a Hollywood version of what's what's happening. I mean, obviously, it's a different story. You know, it's about. Uh, um, oh, I don't know what it's about, but I haven't seen it. But it's about uh, you know people in the states uh, cooking meth, and in their experience, you know, in the forest of Mitchell Khan was was quite quite different. One of the interesting things, actually, that they said um, was that. The, they were, you know, it's a really complex uh, sort of chemistry experiment, experiment to, to cook synthetic meth. And they were taught by a father and son duo who came from the States that they paid to teach them how to cook meth. So. Next question. Right here. Did they have um, any thoughts or any feelings about this enormous rich country that's their customer and these users who use with impunity. Uh, we make little or no attempt to, to stop the users, and they live in a war zone. Do they notice the um, disparity of their lives because of that? They being the, the meth cooks, or, or whom? Well, either the meth cooks or the, the uh, people who are fighting them. On one side of the, there's a war, and then I can go out to some street corner buy meth, do whatever the hell I do. I don't use meth, but <laughs> do whatever you do, and so then, I the work in the morning, uh, then I go to work in the morning. Then I go to work in the morning. And it's, for me, it would be, so what? For them, it's, it's a war zone. I mean, that's, that, that, I think that's one of the things that I tried to do with this film, is that 
first of all, it's a really complicated issue, and 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 what you what you pointed to. There's, there's war and there's peace. There's money here and there's want the money there. That's not right. so complicated to me. I, right. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't rush to say that there isn't a war being fought in the states as well over 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 drugs. I mean, there 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 is war on drugs, war on poverty within the United States. But I don't. It's definitely not the same as what's happening in Mexico. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, the, it's, what you're alluding to is, you know, it's basic supply and demand. As long as there's a demand for drugs up here, there'll be a supply for drugs from Mexico and South America. And, um, you know, there's a, there is a war that's happening in Mexico. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to show with this film is, is the level of violence. Um, you know, we consume these drugs, and these drugs are the basis for this war. They're the basis for this violence. It's, it's, it's not that simple, it's much more complicated and nuanced, but um, I really wanted to show people that what's really happening on the ground in Mexico, the effects of this drug war on everyday people and the response of everyday people rising up to fight back. Next question. Hi, um, are the vigilantes working, in your opinion, um, with your experience, um, based on all the corruption that you've seen and filmed, um, are the vigilantes the most effective way to um, stop these cartels from terrorizing their communities? I, I will say again, I, I'm not a policy expert, and I did not, not make this film um, to sort of change policy. You know, there's many other films or, or people that are trying to do that. I really wanted to show what's happening along the ground. What I saw, I think one of the questions that constantly drove me to make this film is, is sort of asking myself, what would I do if violence came knocking at my front door? What would I do if my sister was raped or my, my brother was hanging from a bridge? What would you do? Would you take up arms? Would you fight violence with violence? Is that right? Is that just? Is, and then the most important question is, is vigilantism sustainable? What's the end game? You know, even though, even though, even though we might be beating back the cartel, what's the end game? You know, how, how are we going to create sustainable s solutions going forward? And I think the sad thing for me is that, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard. And, and I think um, what we see in the film is, is the complexity that comes with, uh, you know, operating outside the law. Have you found that while touring with this film and showing it to audiences that this, is not an exp this film is not an expose, it's not offering answers, it's offering these questions that you are sharing with us right now. Have you found that audiences are looking for expose type answers a lot of the time rather than just sort of willing to go along with the questions that a verite film might ask? Yeah, I think people always want everything to be put in a nice, neat little box. And I think people always want, you know, I think one of the things that, that happens in this film too is, is the complexity of, of humanity, the complexity of our personal choices, the complexity of what drives men and women to rise up. Um, and we see that uh, very vividly in, in our main characters, and, and things are revealed in the film um, that I you know, never thought I could ever reveal in a, in a documentary. But Let's take a, another question right here. Um, the, um, the trailer makes the film look like it could be a, a rather expensive project. And I'm curious whether when you decided to undertake the project, um, where the funding came from and how many people traveled with you? And was it hard to get good crafty? Good. <laughs> good craft services. Good craft services. Uh, <laughs> and that's what you know, this is not a traditional shoot, not a traditional film. I mean, we'd, we could wake up in the morning and we didn't know where we'd be sleeping. We'd sometimes sleep in hostels. We'd sometimes sleep in our car. We'd sometimes sleep on the ground. We'd sometimes sleep in, uh, you know, houses. Uh, that were taken over by the auto defenses, uh, you know, uh, cartel houses. Um, were you guarded when you stayed in those? Did you have guards outside those houses? Did you ever worry that the cartels could, could, could come back and try to take those houses back? When we were on operativos, when we were on missions, uh, you know, we were embedded with the group. So, you know, we were along with them, uh, were, no matter what they were doing. And so... You're crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm crazy. Uh... I mean, that was what's so scary about making this film, and, and is that what you really, especially as the film evolved, is that you really didn't know if you're with the good guys or if you're with the bad guys. Right. We have uh, any more questions? I have time for one more question. 
Hi. I noticed in the trailer that you had unbelievable access to like these violent battle scenes, and I'm wondering how you got that access and if you were barred more often than not than from being on the in the front lines. But stop barred from being on the like if, if they try to stop me from being on the front lines. Um The access, you know, was everything to me. I, I really wanted to put myself right in the middle of this story. And that access wasn't gained overnight. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a few other journalists there covering the story. Um, but they were there, you know, they were there for a day or two days or three days. And it's really, really difficult to tell a story like this, um, as complex as this, in that amount of time. I mean, I, I couldn't have done it. And so, you know, I was there for almost nine months one to two weeks of every month. And I forged relationships with people, many different people. You know, we had a local team uh, of, you know, two to four guys, depending on what was happening. Um, you know, often, sometimes during the more like intimate moments, I, I'd be filming by myself, but I had an amazing uh, crew with me. Um, and, you know, we developed relationships with people. And these relationships allowed us to get into corners that, you know, other people weren't getting into. Um, some corners that I didn't ever expect I could get into and some corners that I didn't necessarily ever want to be in. Um, but that's where the story led us. And I really felt, you know, I fell in love with Mexico. I fell in love with the people of Mexico. And I felt a great duty and a great responsibility to tell the story. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's uh, about all the time we have, but let's take another look at the trailer before we, uh, before we wrap out of here. There's an imaginary line out there between right and wrong, good and evil. I believe what I'm doing is good and what I'm standing up against is evil. Somos los cocineros de metafetamina. Claro que hacemos daño, eh? lo sabemos. It's the cartels. They're the ones terrorizing their own country, and now they're starting to do it over here. ¿Qué harías tú? Esperar que vinieran por ti o que defenderte. The cartel scouts keep getting away. El gobierno no proporciona las garantías de seguridad que el pueblo necesita. Nos podemos armar. They're taking back what is theirs from the cartel. This way it should be done up here too. Nobody touches me. Drop them. Hay una ley que se llama ojo por ojo y diente por diente. Fíjense para atrás. We're the lucky ones for now. Ustedes lo están viendo es porque yo ya dejé de existir.